Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Rob. Nice to see you. Yeah. Welcome to The Real Talk. I'm so so happy to have you on. I know your expertise in the history of te the technical side, obsolescence management. It's it's what a lot of us are talking today in, in the breaking the supply chain, mitigate that risk. So I'd love to have you and uh, let a little, learn a little bit more about you, your past and what you do at Rochester. Well, I'm shocked to uh, when I did the calculation the other day to realize I've been in the business for 35 years. It doesn't seem like that, but um, sales and the purchasing sides are both sides of the fence, really strategic purchasing at the old Nortel and uh, and then in the electronics uh, components business since then, looking after field application engineers and uh, and um, more recently the technical sales aspects um, for semiconductors. Off. Oh. It's it's uh, that wisdom knowledge is like the legacy of bringing on because there's a lot of information, uh, of course, you know, to the talking to a lot of the new generation to what's happened, because a lot of what's happened 10, 20, 30 years ago is still happening today. And all that information, that knowledge is key to build the awareness of how management supply chain of obsolescence, how is it working, you know, bringing that into the, in the marketplace and uh, educating and giving that wisdom back to like people like myself to learn from you know the 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 wizards i would say in the industry like you thank you um well i try to impart as much knowledge as i can um <laughs> I really, I really act as the bridge between our suppliers and the sales these days, and so I support it technically, um, and really try to match the capabilities that we got, the stock profiles that we've got with with the customers in the market. So I, I'm frustrated as everybody else in being having my wings clipped for the last uh, 12 months, but uh, I'm finding other ways to get my direct contacts with customers. That's good. That's good. So why don't we break it down a little bit and like define, you know, why do products go obsolete? Well, obsolescence has been around from the very earliest days. Um, Moore's law talks about um, the doubling of transistors on any circuit over a two year period. And really that's kept pace um, almost um, in line with that uh, right from day one. So that means that technologies evolve and as they evolve, it becomes um, cheaper to manufacture the latest product rather than the historical ones. Um, you end up with uh, companies then allowing the older technologies to wither uh, and die to some extent. And their focus is always on the latest and greatest, the lowest power, the cheapest product. Um, their focus is always to what's just over the horizon. Um, it means ultimately they then make the decision to make product lines uh, obsolete. Uh, it's just an inevitable fact, I'm afraid. Um, been around forever. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, it's it's the obsolescence is um, of course because just like you explained it, the longevity of some product cycles. You know, the obsolescence come with the management is there. You know, understanding really what's going on, but also building a roadmap. You know, and I think that the planning of obsolescence isn't solidified as much as a lot of customers that understands the obsolescence management because engineers design in and then it goes into the product and sometimes they don't look at the end of life. Some products could be end of life in, in a year and they just designed it in. Um, mm. Of course, today, a lot of information is out there of the life cycles, but you know that comes in from the start to finish is understanding that getting more education of obsolescence management understanding how to design something in that has a long life cycle. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, Rochester itself coming in, mitigating that to help the customer pick the right component or also mitigate that, uh, that gap of, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, life cycle is um, forecastable. Um, I'll put it in those terms. There are lots of companies out there that will attempt to pull all of that data together from the market um, and give you a view about how long a semiconductor will be available for. Those are typically al algorithms. Um, they're based on technology and feedback from the original manufacturer. And under a normal circumstances, if you can see well in advance when a product's going to go obsolete, um, you can plan for that. You can choose to replace it. You can choose to end your product. Um, you can buy product in order to support your uh, production for longer. However, 
those predictabilities, um, the ability to be able to absolutely precisely define when a semiconductor is going to go end of life is increasingly difficult. Um, if you take out natural disasters and the COVID uh, pandemic that you have at the moment, which throw a curveball into any equation, you've got acquisitions, you've got the unknown always round the corner, that a company coming in and acquiring another has a totally different strategy, has a different fabulous um, strategy about where it wants to um, put its products. Um, it, it is a constantly moving market and therefore predictions need to be taken with uh, a fair degree of uncertainty. Uh, they, they need to have an element of uncertainty, which is perhaps um, missing from the data. I mean, there are companies out there, the likes of Z2 Data, IHS Silicon Expert, that will give you great reports, that will, will be able to um, put in a bill of materials um, and, and predict when certain key products are going to go end of life. But there is always that curveball waiting to catch you out at the end of the day. And really, that's where, where Rochester comes into its own those uncertainties those unknown factors where your market suddenly changes you you predict what you're going to be building for the next five years and hey presto demand goes through the roof uh, after the point at which you would made a commitment on last time by that's where Ro rochester can step in really and uh, and bridge that gap so we're there when things don't go right yeah. That's that's the easiest way to put have it. A I tagline, think. Rochester have a tagline. It's like Rochester is bridging the gap. A supply. Yeah. Yeah. No, these are, yeah. And you know, if everything worked perfectly, if the market worked per worked perfectly and the supply chains worked perfectly, yeah. and everybody could predict perfectly what the market was going to do, we wouldn't have a job. But um, we're there for those rainy days. Of course. So, what are the types of um, technology or services that Rochester offers for uh, two OEMs or EMS contract manufacturers um, to prepare for these type of disruptions? Well, we um, also track all of those um, technology changes and the obsolescence. Um, the relationships that we've got across the market are really long standing, 40 years, some of our oldest uh, ones. And we are an authorized and trusted partner of every one of those manufacturers. That means that we can uh, identify where certain technologies are going and as and when those products are, are notified as uh, uh, at end of life, that's when Rochester can step in. Uh, that's when Rochester's relationship with the manufacturer can provide a third option, um, an ability to be able to um, have long-term support for authorized products. So as and when they make their product end of life, the manufacturer then sends everything else that's surplus to Rochester. Okay. And what in Rochester's increasingly trying to do is to make sure that we position our manufacturing and our stock to support those long-term needs in the market. Um, it's been done probably passively in the past in that we've accepted the last time by date and picked up what was left. Increasingly now, though, Rochester is committing to finish goods builds at end of life as part of the customer base. Um, we are committing to wafer purchases so that with all of the IP that comes with that, the, the test IP, the authorization, the established um, assembly processes wherever possible, with all that in place, we can seamlessly transition from the uh, original manufacturer through to a Rochester build and then provide that service for 10, 20, 30 years. We've got products that we're producing today that went end of life in the 1990s, and yet there are still significant parts of the market that need that uh, need those products and will continue to need those products for many more years to come. So we're, we're there for, for that. So let me break that down a little bit because it's, it's so fascinating. Um, 
So Rochester not only stocks the finished uh, semiconductors, but you also do the wafers. You stock wafers uh, with the certs from the customer, with all the test protocols, and then you send them out to a house for packaging house, correct? Is that how, how is that working? Yeah, um, yeah, we also have our own in-house capability, okay. but we uh, recognize that we can't ultimately have every package capability ourselves. And so we have excellent relationships with the big one, the big uh, packaging houses like the Amcors of this world. Uh, we use them as part of our supply chain in order to supply and support uh, products for the long term. Um, we have 12 billion wafer in stock, uh, dye in stock. And so there's an awful lot we can do. But what really separates us from, from the rest of the crowd is that we are a seamless and fully integrated part of the manufacturer themselves. So we don't do anything without the manufacturer say. So everything we build is fully authorized, fully tested, fully 100% in compliance with the original spec. And so there is no need to requalify a Rochester built Intel processor as opposed to the Intel processor that Intel supplied you. We still put the same part number on the outside. We still give you all the same guarantees uh, in terms of performance. So there's a there's a huge amount that, that we can do, but the problem we have is that there are unlimited opportunities to invest and a finite uh, pot. So we have to focus our resources and engineering effort and investment where there's the best long term needs for us that we can see in the market. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's fascinating. One uh, question I have is for that's one thing I want to define that. So you as making having the wafer, sending it to packaging house, coming back, and it could be an Intel or any type of semiconductor chip. You guys have the certs of say Intel specs, Intel tested, and you sell as Intel part number. But is there something that says for customer at side is it, it's produced by Rochester yeah. and manufacture CFC and guarantee to the end customer? Um, yeah. Because I know you've probably had some situations where you're providing a part and like customer starts questioning you. You know, these are things that, you know, so what are the, how are those guarantees and the traceabilities and how do you, you know, kind of mitigate that to educate the customer, the user? Rob, that's a, a perfect question because every customer you speak to has that as their initial concern. Right. Rochester is a, um, a well, uh, a well hidden secret perhaps sometimes the capability to be able to take an original product like that and offer a hundred percent identical guarantee um, with all the original warranties is is just really not uh, understood in the market and wide, widely publicized but we are there as that authorized um, partner when when we get the product it is all the original test IP, it's all the original assembly IP, and in some cases we get the wafer GDS in order to be able to look at the full electrical performance as well of, of, of that wafer. Mm -hmm. Now, when we build, um, we test we build it to the same specs, we test it to the same specs. Mm -hmm. We are allowed to put the same part number on there, but because we are legitimate and we don't want to create any confusion out there. You get a Rochester logo as well as um, the current date code rather than um, the Intel uh, logo that you would have seen on, 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 on there before. One question I have back is that for the component side, when you have a fab, I, I, I want to understand that for, for my simple layman side is when you go to have a fab in stock and you want to get packaged, is the date code of that component the fab date code or or the wafer date code or is it the package date code? How does that work? No, it's the package date code. Okay. Um, it's, okay. um, ultimately, we store wafer um, for tens of years um, in some cases, eventually to pick it out of store, package it and fully test it. So um, the original wafer date could have been years before and in many of the semiconductors that you'll see in the market at the uh, at the moment that are sold with a date code the wafer may way may well have been built um months if not years in advance so it, it 
it's uh, it's sometimes tracked as a lot number but rarely do the um does the end buyer really know um when the original wafer was tracked they do know of course die iterations and those change as we talked about in terms of technologies the shrinks the ability to get more dye on a wafer as that improves mm-hmm. or um, t- tightens them and, and, and reduces the size of the silicon. Um, y- you have to be able to track that because there are changes that come as a result of it. But that's really the only thing that most manufacturers would, would be aware of in terms of the wafer itself. No, it's uh, it's fast. So and another question I have, because I'm just talking about for the, the traceability side um, for people, when you put the codes on the wafers, you know, there's the serial codes, the serial numbers. Where do yeah. those trace back to? They trace back to a manufacturing lot. I mean, it's not something that you would be able to identify from the outside, but there is a conversion um, known by the original manufacturer, which then will tie it to a process and a lot number. So they can trace every wafer back to the um, the shift that and the lot that it was produced on just in case uh, particularly in the automotive market they need this sort of traceability in case there's an issue in one particular lot they can then immediately isolate and understand what the implications are for that which product which semiconductors it went into and the manufacturers can then um, trace all of those so full traceability that sort of level is is hidden in in those sorts of applications yeah that's what just hitting on top of the mitigating the risk of uh, counterfeits you know in supply chain and how how stringent the um the qualifications are these days to be able to supply to any type of um industrial i mean automotive medical aerospace that that traceability is very key because if something fails there has to be a flow through the yes. process Right. There has to be a flow. And uh, for um, and for myself, learning from that, because as I, said, I always have questions, I can assume. But learning from a professional, as someone who has the experience, um, yeah. I learned I learned I uh, learned a lot. This is I, I really appreciate it. I mean, you're full of knowledge. Can I can sit here and talk to you for days about <laughs> process management and how, how you how, how it works. And uh, because as I said, these simple questions of traceability, lock codes, the wafer, how they're packaged. You know, I have a sum. I've had assumptions I've talked to, but talking to Rochester or someone in in this in this in this space who does this on a daily basis that's where that knowledge and uh, wisdom comes from too so. uh, and uh, you know uh, we try to emphasize what authorized means um, in terms uh, you know most people will will um, understand that if a, 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 a track a part number you understand that one thing is equivalent to another but it's not. Um, what we're trying to say um, here is that uh, if you have an authorized supplier um, and they they exist out there for the main production um, uh, that that, uh, that supported in every industry, but there are also authorized aftermarket. Um, manufacturers and distributors like Rochester, when you get something from them, the guarantees that you get that the product has always been within the authorized channel yeah. are are enormous. It means that product has been handled properly, it's been stored properly, mm-hmm. and that it is what it says it is. Looking at the part number and a package product and uh, and the product that's out there at the moment that is floating around in the market, you have none of those guarantees. You may be able to see what you think is the same product on the outside. And we all have heard about some of the counterfeit product that's out there. Um, but they're, they're the only way to really mitigate counterfeit um, completely is to stay within the authorized channel. And we try to get that message over wherever possible. Yeah, yeah, I um, I agree. You know, we you know, there's a lot. That's a whole other level for itself. So the anti counterfeiting that uh, we can get into a, on a later episode. But yeah. I really uh, appreciate this and appreciate the time you put into this and this knowledge. Uh, thank you, thank you. Is there any other 
any other wisdom that you have or any other knowledge that you can share on the obsolescence side for the future and what you think is really going to happen in the next two, three, four, five years and how Rochester is going to adapt um, and help service the industry? Well, I, I just want to touch really on um, on the fabulous part of the industry. Um, we've talked about our ob uh, is obsolescence predictable? And under most cases, it is. That, though, however, assumes that the manufacturers control their processes and an awful lot of the semiconductor industry no longer control, controls the fab that they're producing. Um, we know that um, the investment involved in, in putting a new fab in place is huge. Those companies, and there are very few of them worldwide now, will decide which technologies to um, to invest in and which uh, technologies to cut. It is no longer the semiconductor manufacturer themselves that will control that date. And we're seeing it at the moment around us. So predicting the unpredictable, um, everybody has to get better at doing that, I'm afraid. And we're here to try and fill that gap wherever it doesn't quite work. I mean, yeah, you hit a great point is when the when three fab houses in the world control most of the supply chain of the wafers. Um, and as the nanometers of semiconductor weight is getting smaller and smaller, the technology is getting smaller and smaller, um, some of that legacy product is set to go. They're going to choose, okay, we don't, this is not what we want. We're going to 5G. We're going to smaller, like from seven to five nanometers to three nanometers, the smaller, the, the, the package size with even more transistors on it coming to the Moore's law. I mean, we are, it's quantifying. It's going up every year over year um, faster. Sometimes you think faster than Moore's law. Moore's law is even, as a, that's a whole other subject. Is it still valid? But that's a whole other thing we can talk about. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. And that, that's a great point. It's like, they can decide all their eggs in one basket. They decide what stays and what goes and what they work on. And that's going to really disrupt a lot of these semicons um, production and how, how they do. Because that, you know, brought me to a point. It's like, why do companies obsolete so many of these small transistors is maybe it's not because they want to, or, you know, the Texas Instruments, the, all these companies out there, but maybe their fab houses just don't want to produce it anymore. And yeah, they don't um, and we're seeing that around us today is all I can say. It is um, it is a reality. And unfortunately, we there are few choices. The fabs everywhere um, are almost unique. Yeah. Um, it is impossible, really, to to port um, the sorts of technologies that we have now. Um, really, when that fab goes, and if it goes instantly or in a much shorter time scale than the manufacturer was uh, was predicting, you need something to be able to bridge that gap. Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah, we're there for that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ken. Thank you for all the information. Thank you for coming on the Real Talk. I'd love to talk to you again a little bit more what's going on in the future. But anyways, take care and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank See you. you.